Hi, welcome to Avocet Math. In this video, I'd like to say a few more words about the multiplication principle before we move on to the example problems from the AMC. Now, the multiplication principle is a bit tricky because it comes in two different subtle forms. In the simplest form, the choices we're trying to multiply are independent of one another. So in our simple example from the prior video, we were looking at forming points along the xy plane in which we restricted our choice of x values in the set of 2, 3, 4, and 5, and our choice of y values from the set of 1, 3, and 4. And it's pretty easy to see from this simple example that we form this two-dimensional grid of possible xy points, and the number of xy points is given simply by the number of values available for the x-axis choice times the number of values available for the y. And in this case, the number of xy points is given simply by 3 times 4, which is equal to 12. Now we can also use this xy representation to represent other items. So for example, uh, if we were to consider the roll of two dice, and we're trying to understand the total number of outcomes for two dice, we could use the x value to represent the value of die number one, and it could come up anywhere from one to six. And we could use the y axis to represent the values for die number two, and it could come up anywhere from one through six. And here again, the value for die number one is independent from the die value for number two. And so the number of available outcomes for these two dice is given simply by the direct product or the compound set formed by the number of available values for the x-axis times the number of available values for the y-axis. And that forms again this familiar grid of 36 points to indicate all possible outcomes from two dice. Now in the second example I'd like to consider I'd like to look at uh, the question of the number of three-digit numbers. And to examine this by uh, looking at the possible choices for the three digits, the units digit, the tens digit, and the hundreds digit. So for the units digit, it seems as though we can choose digits from 0 to 9 for 10 available choices. And for the tens digit, we can choose 0 through 9 for 10 available choices. And for the hundreds digit, we can't choose a leading 0, so we have to choose from digits 1 through 9 for 9 available choices. And the critical judgment here is that our choice for the hundreds digit is independent from our choice for the tens digit, and they're independent from our choice for the units digit. So we can use the multiplication principle to find the total number of choices combinations as being 9 times 10 times 10 for 900 choice combinations, which represents the total number of three-digit numbers. Now this is the case, again, where the choices we're trying to multiply are independent of one another. So in the case for the xy axes, our choice for the y value was independent of our choice for the uh, x value. And for our three-digit number, the choices that we had for each digit were independent of one another. So let's consider the other flavor of the multiplication principle, where the choices are not independent. However, the number of choices at each step uh, are independent of the prior choices. So let's see what I mean by that. So let's consider the case of five items, which we're going to label a, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to try to consider the case where we're going to select three items from this set of five items and place these items into one of three available labeled bins. So one item per bin. So for example, we could choose items A, B, and C. That's one choice. Or we could choose a different combination of ABC, for instance BAC, and that would be a distinct choice, and so on. And likewise we could choose perhaps CDE to go into bins 1, 2, and 3. 
or some variant of CDE, for instance, CED, and so on. So if we examine this problem carefully, we realize that for each of these bins, we can basically decide how many choices we have available. So if we go down bins one, two, and three, at the first bin, we realize that we have five choices to make for bin number one. And having made this choice for bin number one, when we get to bin number two, there'll be four available choices remaining. Now having made the choices for bins number one and bins number two, we realize that no matter how, do the, no matter how these choices are made, the number of choices available for bin number three will always be three. So in this case, the choices that are available at each step will depend upon a previous step. However, the number of choices that are available at each step is independent of the prior steps. So in this case, we can still use the multiplication principle to compute the number of permutations as being the multiplication of the number of choices for one times the number of choices remaining for two times the number of choices remaining for three, and that's given by five times four times three, which is equal to 60. So this is the classic permutation problem. And I'd like to make one more example where we consider a variant of the three digit number problem. And so let's consider the problem where we're looking for the number of three digit numbers with no duplicate digits. So in this case, we can perform the analysis similar to what we did before and see where things can go wrong. So here again, let's look at our three digits and let's go down uh, from right to left and examine the tens digit. It can be anything from digits zero through nine for 10 available choices. And having made this choice now, we find that we will have nine available digits to choose from for the tens digit. So that's all pretty clear. But when we get to the hundreds digit, we have a problem because it appears as though we could have eight possible digits to choose from, or we could have seven possible digits to choose from, depending on whether the, the zero digit was chosen in either the tens or the units place. So here's a case where the number of available choices for the hundreds digit is not independent of the prior choices. And it, in fact, it depends on whether the zero was chosen in one of the prior choices. So here's a case where the multiplication principle does not work. And we can't just simply multiply these numbers together. However, we can approach this problem from a slightly different point of view, where we try to um, address the hundreds digit first, because that's the most restrictive digit. And let's see how that might work. So here again, let's take a look at the hundreds digit first. And it appears as though we can choose between the digits one through nine, because again, we don't have a leading zero. We have nine available choices. And no matter how we choose this hundreds place digit, the number of available digits for the tens place will always be nine. And no matter how we choose the hundreds and the tens place, the number of available digits, if you look at this carefully, for the units digit will always be eight. No matter how that zero digit is, gets distributed, the number of available choices at the, at the units place will always be eight. So here's a case where the choices are not independent, but the number of choices at each step is independent of the prior choices. And that's the key that allows us to still apply the multiplication principle to determine that the total number of permutations of digits with no duplicate digits is given by the multiplication of the number of choices for the hundreds digit times the number of choices available for the tens digit times the number of choices for the units digit, and that's equal to 648. So for this second case of the multiplication principle, it's key that at each step, the number of choices available is independent of the prior choices. 
And if that's the case, we can still use the multiplication principle. So it's the second case which is a little bit more nuanced. When we can identify uh, choices that are completely independent, it's very easy to apply the multiplication principle. But when we have this sort of dependency, uh, then it becomes a little more tricky to apply the multiplication principle properly. We have to be careful that even though these choices are somewhat connected, we have to be sure that at each step in the process, the number of choices is independent of all the prior choices. And if we can attack the problem in such a way that we can satisfy this condition, then we can use the multiplication principle to find the total number of permutations. And uh, anyway, that's something that's uh, difficult to, uh, to get a hold of, but uh, it's something that's discussed in a little more detail in the Art of Problem Solving videos. And I think uh, they refer to this as multiplication with restrictions. So if you want some more detail on that, check out those videos, and uh, we'll see you at the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.